Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi zidni ilma, Rabbi shahli sadri wa yisilli amri wa ahlul uqdatum min lisani yafqa qawli amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, ikhwan al-Muslimin. Hello everyone, wherever you are around the world. Uh, thank you for joining the live. Um, today's topic of discussion is a super interesting one. How do we achieve salvation? Um, because this is something, you know, we all know for a fact that one day we're all going to be six feet under, right? We're not going to be holding hands with our loved ones or anything like that. Uh, we're going to be six feet under and then we're going to rise on the day of judgment alone. And on that day, you can't go back and say, let me redo things. You have one chance in this life to make it right. So let's make sure that we're doing the best that we can to ensure that we make the right decision for ourselves and our hereafter. So without further ado, I'll pass it off to, to Brother Beyond and Brother Ali to sort of kick it off and then they can go from there. All right. Uh, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, Bismillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Um, thank you all for attending again. Uh, it's my pleasure. And I'm glad we actually decided upon this topic in particular because a few of the um, past ones were more academic and more um, textual. So it didn't really give us a lot of opportunities for people to um, like correspond and to give feedback or to, uh, because a lot of it was, was new material. This topic is uh, infinitely more important, right? Because even if a text is preserved, even if, um, you know, a text is, you know, pristine or internally coherent, et cetera, et cetera, uh, if it does not present a a logical, practical way for a human being to, you know, understand where he's going at the at the end of his life, or to know how it is to to please his Lord and to get ready for the meeting with uh, with God, then none of it really really matters. It just becomes um, just historical material between between letter. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the uh, we're going to try our best to accurately represent the conceptions of salvation within our worldview, within Islam, what we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed as the final method of uh, atoning for one's sins, uh, gaining righteousness, and being accepted into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, and in, eventually into paradise. And contrasting that with the uh, Christian conception, Judeo-Christian, but more, more, uh, more um, specifically the Christian conception, as there are too many nuances within Jewish soteriology uh, and um, eschatology that I don't think I'm even uh, knowledgeable enough to, to speak about that. When it comes to like rabbinic Judaism, I know Ali might might be much more uh, knowledgeable in that regard. So um, I'll begin by trying to lay out what I believe is the uh, consistent Christian paradigm that we've been told by like the mainstream uh, masses of Christianity along with the, the scriptural basis for those texts um, and why I believe that it is uh, incorrect, irrational, and uh, just not, not even practical for a human being. Okay? So the Christian paradigm is basically that um, it has to do with the fall of man. <laughs> the fall of man, basically. This is where the story begins. It begins with Adam and Eve being created in God's likeness. What that specifically means is a subject to interpretation and some interpretations even within Christian uh, circles and populace very, very, uh, very pretty significantly from one another. But basically that they were created to kind of mimic the bidding of God, you know, to be holy like him, to um, want good like him, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, at some point they were uh, tested and deceived by a serpent who that serpent is again is is very uh, ambiguous uh we 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 know who that serpent was or, or that individual was in islamic theology but i have heard and have read many different opinions regarding that uh when it comes to christian text and christian belief so and it goes it goes on that eve then compelled her husband to eat from the tree of knowledge the tree of knowledge of good and evil and uh they were commanded not to do it they were, they were told that once you eat of this tree, you will surely die. Okay, and uh, to be fair, a you know a 
a charitable interpretation would be that you would become mortal. Uh, that uh, once you eat of this tree, you will become mortal and uh, you wouldn't live forever. Um, and so Adam reached for that apple or they both reached for, for that, or it doesn't even say apple, but for that, for that tree and, uh, and ate from it. And then God expelled them. Uh, their, their nakedness was displayed before them and a, a lamb was, uh, was unalived and to, to make skin and to cover their, their nakedness. And a lot of, um, a lot of uh, Christians take this as a kind of typology for the impending messianic uh, atonement. Basically, Jesus coming and uh, covering the nakedness of the world by his, by his blood, which, which is a very powerful picture, to, to say the least. Uh, you don't have to wonder why people are very, they, they gravitate towards that, that idea. Now, we're, we're uh, setting aside the internal contradictions between how it is that it can even be considered a fall. When Adam was, did not know that eating of the tree would be evil, since he had no idea what good and evil was. He only gained that attribute, he only gained that realization and that epiphany after eating of, of the tree. So you already have something very uh, peculiar going on with how in the world a newly created being, a baby, so to speak, who was still learning his place in, 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 his, in, his, uh, in his paradise, how he would be punished for doing something that he had no idea was even illegal was doing something that was that was evil. It would be like if there were no if there were no signs um, you know directing you on how you should uh, where you can park, let's say, in a parking lot. And you park there and then the police officer comes and hands you a, a big ticket or maybe even puts you in jail uh, or parking at a space where there was no indication that you knew that um, it was not permissible to uh, to park there. It would just be unfair. It goes against what we know of standard justice. And Christians always like to claim that God is perfectly just. To me, this actually violates the, the, the principle of justice. But that, that's, that's uh, the first thing. The second is that story would be very, again, very powerful if it were not contradicted at every turn by Levitical practice, by um, various passages in the Ketavim, uh, the, the books and in the prophets and in the Psalms. The, and this is, this is what I find very peculiar about the Christian worldview. Whenever you speak to them about salvation, they always resort to rationalizing the coming of Christ with that initial motif, with that initial typology, with that imagery, with that symbolism, and not with the plain text of the commandments of, uh, of their God, uh, of God's history. I don't like saying their God. Uh, it seems a little bit combative, but uh, for all intents and purposes, when I say God, I mean their conception of God. So I'll just say that. Uh, so there are various passages which uh, explicitly, I mean very explicitly, it would be hard for a human being to sit down and actually uh, compose more clear language about the futility and about the frivolous nature of sacrifices. They are, they are oftentimes spoken of as detestable carcass that you should leave on, uh, you know, that God does not desire at all. They are just, you know, fat, fat in flesh. And then there are, they are contrasted with passages about God saying that he only exclusively desires your, your, um, your repentance, a change of heart, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh reference, a change of heart or a, um, a, an epiphany of some sort, something that is actually practical in the life of an individual to where it actually propels him forward into righteousness and not simply a, a token or a technicality. So the first one I want to point out is the prayer of Solomon. Remember, the Christian worldview is that without the shedding of blood, as it says in the epistle according to the Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. There is no forgiveness of sins. In fact, God saw that he had already given them such a um, uh, kind of like a, a, a methodology to work around that he ended up replacing the bulls and, and the lambs with his only begotten son. And this is why I sometimes tell Christians that John 3.16 should actually read like that for, for God so loved lamb and bulls and cows that he gave his only begotten son. Because the same, uh, the same end that was being achieved by virtue of those animals, God simply just replaced them with, with a human being, a, a completely innocent human being. Right? And alhamdulillah, I just had a double burger patty. I loved it. Me and my son had a, a cheeseburger with, uh, with 
beef bacon. And uh, so we don't really have to think twice about the, the sacrifices of animals because we, we eat them all the time. It's not, it's not a big deal. Uh, so to replace a system like that, that was already giving a person righteousness, that was already giving a person uh, holiness and, and nearness to God with a human being seems very vindictive. It's like you're already, um, you already have a, a good way of getting to work. You're commuting with your car and uh, your car is very reliable and you're getting there every day. And all of a sudden you decide to just walk on your hands and, and tape a, a bunch of glass to your wrists so you can get to work. Seems, it seems frivolous, it seems uh, unnecessary. So uh, this is what Solomon's prayer says in 1 Kings 8, 46. So this is about so Solomon uh, praying to God about what the Israelites should do uh, when they are sent into exile because of their sins, because their sins have overtaken them. And usually the exilic uh, circumstances are because God sees that the children of Israel are so far removed from his commandments that he just decides to punish them for this. Okay, so in... Again, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46 onwards, says, When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them, and deliver them to an enemy who takes them as captive to his own land, whether far or near. And when they come to their senses in the land to which they were taken, and they repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, We have sinned and done wrong. We have acted wickedly. And when they return to you with all their heart and soul in the land of the enemies who took them captive, and when they pray to you in the direction of the land that you gave them to their fathers, the city you have chosen and the house I have built for your name, then may you hear them from heaven, your dwelling place, uh, their prayer and petition, and may you uphold their cause. Forgive your people who have sinned against you and all the transgressions they had committed against you. And may you grant them compassion in the eyes of their captors to show them mercy. So here Solomon is saying that if the people turn to God and they simply pray, because there is no temple, there is no way to, to um, sacrifice uh, any animals at all, and we'll get to that a little bit later, uh, then if they do that and they turn and they repent with their hearts, that God will hear them from his dwelling place, uh, from, from heaven, and he will forgive them their sins, and he will uphold their cause. This is very similar to what we find in the Qur'an. Is very similar to what we find in the Quran. The Quran is much more consistent with the quote unquote prophets. For example, when Adam and Eve uh, both sinned, it says, Qala Rabbana Zalamna and Fusana, wa in lam tawfir lana wa tawhamna lana kunana min al khasiri. It says uh, that when they, when they sinned, they said, Our Lord, indeed we have oppressed ourselves. And if you do not forgive us and have mercy upon us, we will be of the losers. And in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, God, God says that he forgave them. Adam learned um, uh, phrases of repentance and forgiveness, and God forgave him. Indeed, he is the, the, uh, the, the acceptor of repentance, the most merciful or the most compassionate. So it's very similar. What the New Testament says is that you cannot be forgiven unless there is the blood of an innocent man on a cross um, to somehow make up for a law that God moved himself into a corner in order to fulfill. When we know that God can override any of his commandments, he's done that plenty of times. In fact, the entire idea of the law being abolished is, is a perfect representation of that. So God would not be bound to sacrifice his only child to be in conformity with a law that he gave to the Israelites, which actually wasn't actually even a law. We will get into that. Uh, because they were hard-hearted. This wouldn't make any sense. God is the ultimate authority. Quran says, لا يسأل, لا يسأل يسأل God is not asked about anything that he does. And he does whatever he wants. فعال لما يريد. That he is the, the, the disposer of anything he wants to do. Right? Whenever he wants something, whenever he decrees, decrees something, he just says to it, be, and it is. Um, so that's just very simply the um the dichotomy between the, the the i guess the basic dichotomy between the christian conception and the muslim judeo christian judeo uh conception because I, a lot of christians don't seem to know this but we have alhamdulillah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed us square in the middle of many different uh extremes allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah al-baqarah wa wasata. we have made you a people in the middle a, a, a moderate nation and so we have closeness to the to the Jews in the fact that we still maintain a code of law and ethics and the the 
the unwavering regard for monotheism, even though the, the Jews do fall in, in that, they, they falter in that area as well, but not, not as much as, as the Christians. And we are closer to the Christians because we are not as rigid in the understanding of the law, nor do we, uh, of course, reject the, the Messiah, right? Nor do we have an ethnocentric view of salvation. So uh, I'm going to get to like more passages about what actually the uh, the Torah says about animal sacrifices and what they represent. All right. Uh, so, all right. So let's let's briefly go over some of the ways. So this is what the Quran says. The Quran says in Surah Az-Zumar, this is chapter 39, verse 53. It says, "Qul ya Say, say, O Prophet, that Allah says, My servants, O oh my servants, who have exceeded the limits against their souls, do not lose hope in Allah's mercy. For Allah certainly forgives all sins. He is indeed the all-forgiving, all-merciful. This is, this is the, the true conception of a loving God. This is the true conception of a living, of a loving God. One who does not need uh, to shed anyone's blood, one who does not need arbitrary technicalities in order to build a, a connection with mankind, one who has always been available to human beings it, um, for, since, since the, the, the dawn of the first creation. He does not need to uh, hide his presence from anyone. Uh, so, uh, you know, Christians often say that there is no greater love than laying your life down for someone. No, but the greater love is actually forgiving without payment. The greatest love is telling somebody you are forgiven, even though you have wronged me, because I see the the, the status of your of your uh, regret. That's that's true love. And when the, and when Jesus asks rhetorically to the Pharisees, which of you, if your child or, or your ox were uh, falling in a ditch and it was a Sabbath, which one of you would not come and rescue him? Uh, I, I don't know about the the Pharisees, but I do know one father who, who wouldn't do that, and that's the Christian father. The Christian father does not love his son. The Christian father had an opportunity to give people a method of salvation in which they are fully accountable and open, open his, the doors of mercy for his servants, but instead decided to send his only begotten son to suffer, to suffer um, unnecessarily, pushed him onto oncoming traffic. That is a sadistic form of love. That is not love. That is actually child abuse, as, as one, um, one day I put it. Okay. The Quran also says in Surah Al-Furqan, this is chapter 25, uh, in verse uh, uh, verse 68 onwards. So it, it mentions a lot of uh, a lot of sins that people commit. It says, and those who do not invoke with Allah any other deity or kill or unalive the soul which Allah has forbidden except by its right and do not commit uh, fornication or adultery. And whoever does that, they will meet a grievous penalty. <inaudible> Multiplied for him is the punishment on the day of resurrection and he will abide therein humiliated. Except for the one for those who repent and believe and do righteous good works, for them Allah will replace their evil deeds with good, and ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. And he who repents and does righteousness does indeed turn to Allah with a beautiful repentance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that regardless of what you do, it can be, uh, you know, the, the, the most heinous sins, adultery, uh, murder, uh, any of these sins. If you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you regret it and you do your best as a human being because Allah does recognize that the temptations and the influences are so great in the world. He created the world. He, he knows it more uh, intimately than anyone else. He is. He is the knower of the, the seen and the unseen. He knows your circumstances. And so if he sees in your heart that you are truly repentant and you turn to him, then he will forgive you. That is, that is a loving God. Not a God who needs to uh, 
put someone else to death in order to forgive you. Uh, so, the, and, and there are many, many more Quranic passages. And this concept of not desiring sacrifice is not foreign from the Old Testament. Absolutely not. In fact, it is only foreign from the butchered um, understanding of Gentile Christianity, of Pauline Christianity, where they uh, misappropriate various verses and various concepts in order to justify the the need or like just the events of the crucifixion. Okay, so we have, for example, in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a very uh, famous lamentation psalm, and it records David's regrets and David's um, uh, remorse at what he did uh, concerning uh, Bathsheba, that he, uh, you know, basically uh, unalived her husband and stuff. We don't really do that, but this is what the Old Testament says. And Samuel, he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving devotion, according to your great compassion. Blot out my trans. He's asking for God to cleanse him of his sins. Why does he not just go and offer a sacrifice? Because he never had this concept. Wash me clean of my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And he keeps going and going. Surely you desire truth in the inmost being. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guilt, O God, the gift of uh, uh, the God of my salvation. For you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. Look, look at this, um, this clause right here. It's, it's, a, it's a caveat, right? You, for you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You take no pleasure in burnt offerings. How can God not take pleasure in something that he actually mandated? Does God not take pleasure in the, uh, the obedience of his servants? Absolutely he does. If he's saying that you take no, no, um, no like, uh, like happiness or, or no pleasure or no delight in, in sacrifices, that means he did not command it. Uh, the, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a nedem. And nedam and, re and regret. Sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Your good pleasure cause uh, uh, your good in your good pleasure cause Zion to prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in whole burnt offerings. Then bowls will be offered on your altar. Saying once you once you forgive me, and my sins are cleansed, then you will get righteous sacrifices. That means, or, or in another translation, sacrifices of the righteous. Some scholars like James Tabor think this is a, uh, you know, a later edition, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, it's saying that you will get sacrifices of thanks and offerings that for, uh, because you have built up the wall, because you have forgiven us, this is what we will do. There's a very similar concept in, in Hosea, in Hosea chapter 14, verse 2. Okay. Hosea says, return, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. For you have stumbled by your iniquity. Bring your confessions and return to the Lord. Return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all our iniquity and receive us graciously that we may present the bulls of our lips. The bulls of our lips. What is that? That means the sacrifices are going to be vic. It's going to be um, remembrance. It's going to be praise. This is what God is sacrificing our time and our, our energy and dedication to God. Right, so this this is like a very similar um, motif. Uh, so so this is like the primary way that that the Old Testament lays out for you to be forgiven. This is always in a very praised like it's God never says he detests repentance. That would be absurd. God never says that. Keep your repentance to yourself, for I do not desire it. But on the contrast, you have this idea of of God never ever really wanting anything to do with the the, um, the offerings. And this is uh, found most uh, most clearly in Jeremiah chapter seven, uh, verse seven, um, verse uh, chapter seven, verse twenty-two. Okay, so this is what Jeremiah chapter seven, verse twenty-two. And you have to be very careful that some of the translations don't render it improperly. 
uh, for Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 22 says, For in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But if you read the NIV, it says, For when I brought your ancestors out of Egypt and spoke to them, I did not just give them commands about burnt offerings and sacrifices. I did not just do it. Which is a big difference. But if, if you read, uh, if, you, if you read, for example, like the JPS Tanakh, for I, for I spoke unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. Right? But I gave them this command, obey me, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Walk in obedience to all I command you, that it may go well with you. So this is a conditional promise to the children of Israel. As long as you obey me, you will be my people. The inverse of that is, if you don't obey me, you will not be my people. Right? So that, uh, this is God, again, accentuating and highlighting what he really does desire from humanity. Um, and that's a repentant heart, um, regret for the evil that they have done, turning a new leaf, becoming good, becoming righteous, obeying him. Of course, what, what master, what father, what um, you know, person in authority would not love that he's obeyed by his, by his, um, either by his constituents or by his family members or by his children or any, right? And God, of course, to God belongs the highest of examples. Um, yeah, so I highlighted the dichotomy between like what God wants uh, in terms of repentance and what He doesn't want, what He doesn't desire in terms of um, in terms of temple sacrifices. But the, and again, this is just in contrast to the Pauline Epistle of Hebrews Alexandrian line of Christianity. Uh, and not the synoptic tradition as a whole, because there are a lot of there are a lot of um, details and a lot of nuances to uh, evangelical soteriology that need to be fleshed out maybe in a later in a later video about were the passion predictions actually something that were uttered by the historical Jesus? What was his original um, his original uh, like message about how to how to get right with God? Did his disciples understand that his his death will uh, remove the sins of humanity? And uh, this is actually a very lively conversation within uh, Christian uh, uh, scholarly circles. So, um, but I will just highlight a few things from, from the Old Testament that uh, will show you how they misunderstand these passages. So um, let's go here to um, one second. Okay, so the sacrifice the, in the Levitical system, Sacrifices are usually, almost all the time, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they are in the context of unintentional sins, unintentional sins. And this is very clear in numerous passages. So if you go to Leviticus chapter 4, everyone can, can follow me to Leviticus chapter 4. The Lord spoke to Moses. This is purification offerings. This is the top or sin offerings, korban khatat in, in, in Hebrew. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, when anyone sins unintentionally, when anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about things not to be done and does any of them, this is what you should do. You go to verse 2. You go to verse 2, same thing. Uh, for, okay. You go to verse 13. If the whole congregation of, uh, go to verse 13. Uh, right there. If the whole Israelite community sins, unintentionally unintentionally and the matter escapes the notice of the assembly unintentional this is what you should do you should bring a dove etc 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 let's go to verse 22 when a ruler sins doing unintentionally any of these commandments unintentionally let's go to verse 27 if any one of the ordinary people among you sins unintentionally in doing any of these things, this is what you should do. Is, is that clear? Let's go to the next chapter in Leviticus chapter 5. So if you go to verse uh, ch Leviticus chapter 5, verse 15. When any of you commit a trespass, a trespass and sin unintentionally. Okay, uh, verse 15. When any of you commit a trespass and sin unintentionally against any of the holy things of the Lord, you shall bring, etc., etc., etc. Okay? So again, these are unintentional sins. You go to verse 18. You shall bring to the priest a ram without blemish, equivalent as a guilt offering, on your, uh, 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 and the priest shall make atonement on your behalf. I can already see a Christian stopping the citation right there. 
as, as they are prone to do. For the error that you have committed unintentionally, unintentionally, it's very, very clear. Let's go to numbers. They say, okay, this is Leviticus, but maybe uh, the some of the um, some of the uh, like priestly ceremonies are, are not for unintentional sins. So let's go to Numbers chapter fifteen. Okay, uh, Numbers chapter fifteen, verses twenty-two. Verse twenty-two. Okay, but if you unintentionally fail to observe all these commandments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera unintentionally unintentionally you go to verse 24 then if it was done unintentionally without the knowledge of the congregation etc etc uh all the way to verse 29 it's still talking about unintentional sins okay uh for both the, for verse 29 for both the native among the israelites and the alien residing among you among you you shall have the same law for anyone who acts in error meaning unintentionally Uh, so these, th I think this is clear, that the temple sacrifices were only meant for unintentional sins. Now, how do we know this as well? Is because God, uh, again, when I say God, I mean it with, you know, with that caveat. This is the Jewish uh, conception of God. Um, what does it say, like, about bigger sins, like actual intentional sins? How should you be forgiven for them? Should you be offering anything? Okay. So if you go to Exodus chapter 22, verse 3. So it's talking about a thief, what a thief does, and how he should expiate for his, sin, for his sins. Okay? It says, but if it happens after sunrise, blood guilt is incurred. The thief shall make full restitution, or if unable to do so, shall be sold for the theft. He doesn't just go and offer a bull, and he's forgiven. Nothing. There's no, there's no actual uh, punishment mentioned, like in terms of a, a temple sacrifice. He is just supposed to be sold into slavery. Okay? Um, Numbers chapter 5, verse 6. Numbers 5. I think it's the same chapter where it talks about unintentional sins. Now it's talking about intentional sins. Speak to the Israelites. When a man or woman wrongs another, breaking faith with this Lord, the person incurs, incurs guilt. Okay. And what does uh, verse, verse 7 say? It says, uh, and shall confess the sin that he has committed. The person shall make full restitution for the wrong, adding one-fifth to it and giving it to the one who was wrong. Nothing about a temple sacrifice. Okay? Uh, so that's very, very clear. He has to actually pay the, the person who was wronged. Um, let's see. I think I mentioned all of the, all of the relevant passages, to be honest. Um, yeah. So are there other ways besides repentance that people can be forgiven for? So absolutely. If you go to, for example, Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 4, this is one of my favorite, one of my favorite passages. Okay. So um, in Ezekiel chapter 4, uh, verses, I think, 3 onwards, it, God is telling Ezekiel what he should do uh, in this vision that he's receiving. And it says that he has to, that God tells him to lie on his left side, to lie on his left side and put the sin of the people of Israel upon him. It says, you will bear the sin of the people of Israel for the number of days you lie on your side. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, so just lying down, a, lying down forgives sins, essentially. Just on, on your left side and on your right side. So for every day, it's going to be like a year. So for 390 years, basically since the time of uh, like the first exile, I, I believe, or from the exodus out of Egypt, it's every one, one year. And so Imagine he has bears. So easy. Lie yeah, lying down can expiate your sins. Mm -hmm. And then the next verse, after you have finished this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the people of Judah. I have, I have assigned you 40 days, a day for each year. And that his sins are forgiven that way. So imagine how easy it is for God just to forgive sins. And now all of a sudden, he has to unalive somebody on a cross and put him through a humiliating punishment. That makes I, I I would be so... Uh, mad at my father if that was the case. I, I would I would absolutely think this man is out of his mind. Like for my for the you know for my um, for my cousins, you forgave them by just you know putting them in time out. But for these other people, I have to go and, and die for their sins. Like why? Why the sudden change? Okay. Uh, 
so number 17 11 well you don't have to go to these passages i'm just going to cite them real quick so leviticus chapter 5 verse 11 says that you can offer a grain sacrifice grain as an atonement number 17 11 says you can offer flour numbers chapter 16 says you can offer incense numbers 31 50 says that you can offer gold and isaiah chapter 6 this is like one of the our go-to uh, rebuttals for the whole y'all worship a rock or y'all think the, the black uh, the black stone takes away y'all seen uh, isaiah chapter 6 is a primary example of god can literally do anything anything at all to forgive your sin he, he has a seraphim an angel a little baby angel take a coal and put it on the lips of isaiah and isaiah's sins are purified by that coal like uh, uh honestly like it's almost a show and tell about the mercy of God, how many things he can do in order to forgive you your sin. But all of a sudden, uh, in the year you know, 30, he decides to um, arbitrarily sacrifice his own son on an altar in the same way that the pagans used to, to offer their own, their own children. Okay? Um, so this is, why this is part of, a big part of the reason why I don't believe that there, it's coherent. This worldview is coherent. You had a very good um, uh, concept of how sins are forgiven in the Old Testament. You repent if you do anything wrong. God likes to see your repentance. He desires it. He is overjoyed. He, he um, derives satisfaction from seeing that his servants are changing themselves, learning from their mistakes. And he detests the, the technicality of burnt offerings, at times saying that he does not require them at all. Like Psalms chapter 40, Psalm 40 for, verse 6, it says, uh, you have desired mercy and not sacrifice. For guilt offerings and burnt offerings, you have not required. You don't require. Like that should be an open and shut case. And now uh, you have people like the anonymous letter of the epistle to the Hebrews saying that it is not only required, you cannot ever be forgiven without it. And I think this one, uh, this one fact, I mean, aside from the Trinity, aside from, you know, uh, like just the the historical and technical aspects of the religion and the development, et cetera, et cetera. This idea of salvation should be enough to have them look elsewhere. And that elsewhere is only found in the Quran. The, the coherent concept of weights and measures, of people being um, sufficed and uh, getting retribution for the wrongs that, they have been, that, that have been committed against them, and having to return the rights of the people whom they wronged in order to be forgiven from humanity, and uh, God forgiving them based on the um, the acts of repentance and the and the progression that they make in terms of their spirituality, their love for God, their detest for the things that He has prohibited them against. And so, the, what the Quran says in uh, in chapter eight, oh, I'm sorry, in Surah Tahrim, chapter sixty-six, verse eight, says, "Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha." Oh, you who believe. Turn to Allah in sincere repentance. It may be that your Lord will absolve you of your sins, of all your sins. And he will allow you to enter into gardens under which rivers flow. The day when Allah subhanahu wa will not humiliate the Prophet or any of those who believe um, who believe with him their light shining forth from between their from, from uh, in front of them and on their right they will be saying our lord complete for us our light and forgive us our sins indeed you are above you are concerning everything capable you can do anything you want forgive us our sins um, put us into paradise and uh, and all he requires from from his creation is that initial turn that initial um, uh, yearning for him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, man anab, that he will guide to him and he will uh, whoever turns to him and those who strive who try their utmost best who try their best we will guide them to our paths multiple paths about how, how to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it's through charity, whether it's through kind works to, to, your, to your family members, whether it's through uh, like outreach, whether it's through you know um, taking care of orphans, all of these things are expiations for your sins. Indeed, 
good deeds extinguish the, the evil ones. Very, very rational, very um, applicable to our modern life. When you wrong somebody and you, you consistently show them a model of improvement and a pattern of improvement, you, you visit them often, you apologize to them, you remember them on, their, on, the, on special occasions, et cetera, et cetera. That person is going to naturally, if there is any justice within them, if there's any love within them, they're going to appreciate that from you. And this is how, and God, and of course, again, so God is the, the highest of similitudes. Uh, I think we can stop right here for, for my presentation.